Ross Perot on politics as usual. Our great nation is sitting right on top of a ticking bomb. We have a national debt of $4 trillion. 70% of this debt is due and payable in the next five years. This is a bomb that's set to go off and devastate our economy, destroy thousands and thousands of jobs. The two other candidates have told you to just ignore the ticking. They've given you plans that will only delay dealing with the issue. But I've spelled out a solution that will fix this problem starting now. In a few days, you must decide if we should pay our bills and create jobs or just hope this mess will go away as we go over $1 billion deeper into debt every working day. This is a critical time. I know you don't want to waste your vote this year. The fact is, you are wasting your vote this year if you elect a candidate who continues politics as usual. I will not do that. I will deal head on with these problems. I will fix these problems. Cast your vote for your children. Ross Perot for president. This year, in this election, the issue is jobs. The question is, which one of the three candidates is best qualified to get America working again? You could vote for the politics as usual candidates, or you could vote for the man who has created tens of thousands of jobs on his own in the private sector. You could vote for the candidates who come from and stand for big government, or you could vote for the man who will clean up the mess in Washington and get business and government working together so we can compete internationally. The candidate is Ross Perot. He knows how to create jobs. He has been doing it his whole life. The following is a frank conversation with Ross Perot on how we can create jobs in our country and get America working again. Here now is Murphy Martin. Ross, why do you have such an urgency about creating jobs? Our people are hurting. Our standard of living is decreasing. Our people are out of work. We're shipping entire industries overseas. In addition, we have a $4 trillion debt that we have to pay off. We must put our people back to work. We must have a growing, expanding economy. That's our ticket out. What are your priorities for putting these people back to work? We, now, I've been creating jobs all my adult life. I am not a politician. I haven't spent time learning how to do gridlock and avoid responsibility. But I think the record shows pretty clearly I have created huge numbers of jobs. I understand that we can create more jobs more quickly through the small business sector of our economy than any other way. So the highest priority will be to stimulate the small business sector. Small business right now is being starved for two things, credit and capital. These are relatively easy to fix. We can fix credit by changing the banking regulation. It's almost impossible for a bank now because of federal regulations to lend money to a small business. Capital side, we're going to create very powerful incentives for people to invest in small businesses so we can kick that one off and get it going fast. We've got big mature industries that once were the envy of the world that are now downsizing and deteriorating. We need to put together plans industry by industry and company by company to revitalize those industries. We'll work closely with them. The next thing we'll do is target the industries of the future. Every other industrial country in the world is totally zeroed in on these industries. Some of them are uh, biotech, microelectronics, uh, commercial aircraft, robotics, software, computers, so on and so forth. We don't even have a plan in our country. We'll have a plan fast, and 10 years from now, the whole world will be standing there looking at us is the premier manufacturer of those products because they'll have the highest paying jobs for our people. Finally, we will look very carefully at the relationship between government and business. We now have an adversarial relationship. We practice 19th century capitalism. We're headed to the 21st century. We need to have an intelligent supportive relationship between government and business. Our winning industrial competitors do. We don't and we're losing. So we'll clean that up too. That won't take very long and that's a piece of this repair work I understand. Since we can create more jobs utilizing that small business sector, how does a person prepare for starting his own business? My advice to a person who's considering starting a small business is number one, serve an apprenticeship in an industry you're really excited about. Let's assume you have a master's degree in business from Harvard. 
go to work second and third shift on the factory floor, learn it from the bottom up, really know that business, work there a few years, insist on doing every job, and one of these days, a light is going on in your head and you're going to have a really unorthodox idea, an unmet need. The way you find it is by burying yourself in an industry you adore. That's the way you identify the unmet need, and then you have the germ of the idea to start your own company. What are the most important characteristics of a business founder? It's fascinating. I've had an opportunity to know the most successful business builders in this country. It's really been fascinating. Here's a profile. They're not the brightest people you ever met, and certainly I put myself in that category. They know their strengths and weaknesses. They surround themselves with people more talented than they are because they know their strengths and weaknesses. And each person in the organization plays to his or her strengths. There's a second characteristic. These people don't understand failure. They don't know when they've lost. It's, if you wrote a book about any of them, again and again and again, they were beaten but just never recognized it and went on to build a great company. So they have a level of perseverance and stick to it that's really unique. Now, they are people that others will respect and trust. They're very simple people as a group. It's fascinating. They do what they say they will do. Therefore, they earn the trust and respect of people around them. And the ones who build the great companies live with their customers. Sam Walton, standing on the floor of Walmart, the richest man in America, day after day after day, he didn't have to hire consultants to tell him what his customers thought. They were talking to Sam, right? There's a lesson here. The President of the United States needs to be out there listening to the people also and not taking polls. All these big corporations have financial reports and, and uh, consultant companies said Sam was out there, he had that fingertip feel, nothing will ever replace it. Those are the characteristics. What if nobody likes that new business idea, though? Well, there's good news and bad news. For example, my idea was considered so bad that I was stuck with the whole thing. Now, that was painful in the early years, but that was pretty nice when it worked. You can make it work even if you, I had no financial support, nobody would buy my stock, nobody would loan me any money. And here's the good news, if you have to bootstrap it, it is cold roll stainless steel when you finish it because you have developed a pump. You make a little money and you invest it back in the company. You make a little more and you invest it back in the company and pretty soon it looks like an oil well in the Middle East just pumping money. Whereas if you go the other way, you see, you had too much money around. Now that my businesses are very successful, we keep money as a very scarce commodity. Now, if people don't listen to anything else I say tonight, please listen to this. Brains, wits, creative talents of a small, high-talent team will be massive capital spending 10 times out of 10. So I use money like you'd use water going across De Death Valley. You conserve it, and you use the brains and wits of your people. I could tell you a thousand stories. Then that, that is your philosophy about spending money in a new company? In a new company or a big company. See, use the talents and brains and wits of your people and don't just throw money at every problem that comes back. What is the most important trait that the founder must possess in the early days? Well, he, he has to have several, but one is he just has to do this. See, the Wright brothers had to fly. Two bicycle repairmen, they had no business trying, but they had to fly. Thomas Edison had to invent the electric light. I think he tried every way in the world and finally got down to his last option when he got it but he had to do it. That's a common characteristic. Then beyond that, this point I made earlier, know your strengths and weaknesses, surround yourself with talented people. In summary, this very critical factor here is recognizing that you can only do so much and getting the multiplier of the talented team. Then you can grow, otherwise you're a one-man genius operation. Only a handful of people in our great country can create jobs, but thousands of honest, decent people, many brighter than you who created the company, are willing to work at those jobs, but they're totally dependent upon you to keep an environment that protects their jobs and creates thousands of new jobs each year. Now, the quality that got you going, the fact that you persevered, the fact that you didn't quit, the fact that you didn't recognize failure, the fact that you didn't know you'd failed, is the most important quality you can have when you have a worldwide operations and tens of thousands of people all over the world. Just Always focus on what you have to do and do it. What is the single most important objective that the creator of a new business must have? 
you don't listen to anything else I say tonight, it's got to be the best in the world. The best in the world. Say, so wait a minute, how about the best in Idaho? Sorry, best in Texas, no. Best in the U.S., no. We live in a tiny little world, we're stuck with it, and your theme song ought to be, nobody does it better. Nobody does it half as well as you and your team. Then you'll have people all over the world coming around with black notebooks trying to copy you. Now, that's where I'd like to see all of you. What are some important other objectives? Service to your customer. Customer's king. If you just make the customer king, everything will work out. See, if the customer's king, then you've got to have the best people to make the best products to serve your customer. In order to attract and keep the best people, you've got to have an environment where their goals and dreams materialize too. So it all just sort of fits together. Is it important to write down what your company is going to be before you start it? It's the most important thing you'll do. Uh, I did it on a yellow pad before I started my first company. All my hopes and dreams and all my goals and philosophies were there. I wouldn't consider starting a business without doing it very simply, very straightforwardly, and have everybody in your company know what those philosophies are. That's the easy part. Then you, as the founder, have to live them day in and day out. People don't care what you preach. They're interested in what you practice. The worst thing you can do is have these lofty goals and objectives and then not practice them. Live them. Have everybody in your company committed to them. On the interview of new employees, discuss them with them, and they should be so specific that people are really excited about them or do not want to be a part of your company, but at least they know what they're getting into and they know you live it. As you build your company, a lot of your satisfaction will come if you run your business in the center of the field of ethical behavior and not along the sidelines. Unfortunately, in the 80s in business, a lot of companies got cute. And the question was, is it legal or illegal? Never ask yourself that. The only question is, is it right or wrong? Live in the center of the field. Your customers will appreciate that. The people that work with you will appreciate that. And once you go public, believe me, your stockholders will appreciate that. How does a founder of a new company decide who to hire? It's the most important decision you'll make. You want very, very talented people. Uh, over the years, I used to talk to our recruiters, and I said, look, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care where you went to school. I don't care if you went to school. I don't care what race you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what religion you are. Finally, one of the recruiters, since we're in a high-tech business, would say, well, Ross, do you care about anything? I said, you bet. I care about what you can do, and I care about what you've done lately. And then we'd have a little talk on that, because lately is everything. You run into a lot of talented people that want to kick the ball through the goal once, and then walk around and display their clippings. Once you kick the ball through the goal, that's yesterday's news. What are you going to do tomorrow? That's the way business, the faster you run, the faster you have to run, particularly true in a global economy. So then the other thing is, Look for people who have a history of success. You said, wait a minute, don't you want a cookie cutter, MBA, 3.6 grade average, et cetera? No, no, that means anything. Look for people who have a history of success since childhood. Look for people who have a pattern of being the best. Look for people who love to win because you're going to be in brutal competition. You don't have to watch sports in this country anymore to satisfy your competitive instincts because all of us are playing in a worldwide Super Bowl all day, every day for our jobs. So look for people who love to compete and love to win. And I stressed this so hard one day, one of the fellows said, well, what if we run out of people who love to win? I said, well, just get people who can't stand to lose. Because if you have people who have that motivation, see, on their own, they have all this initiative and creativity, and you've got to set your people free. A lot of these big companies keep people reined in, I have a bust of John Paul Jones right outside my office. He became a great naval hero because one enlisted man, acting on his own initiative and not under John Paul Jones' orders, saved the day and made John Paul Jones a hero. Everybody that works with me, when they walk past that, they smile because they know that means if there's something that needs to be done, figure out what to do and use your head. Don't wait for me to tell you what to do. And in nine cases out of nine, they'll come up with a better idea than I had anyhow. Now, that's the way you get the multiplier. A few other thumb rules. If you have a corporate politician, fire him. If you find somebody who is stealing, cheating, or taking advantage of other people, in my companies, that'll get you a free trip halfway around the world. Only I fire those people. Now, that gets the word out. 
that you don't do that, that you work together in good faith and your ethical standards are very high. These are little things, but these are the difference between good and great. Create a professional work environment where people are having fun while they build the finest products. Yeah, that, is, that is so important, and most people don't ever talk about it, but as long as you're going to work hard, as long as you're going to be the best, it's pretty important to look forward to it every morning and walk out the door every night grinning. Now, we have another ground rule in my companies that I would encourage you to adopt. Never go home at night mad. If you're upset about something, go into whoever you need to talk to, get it off your chest, get it worked out, come back in in the morning grinning. How important is the customer to all of this? It's all important, all important. And unfortunately in our country, we tend to forget the customer in many cases, and as soon as you do, you lose touch with the customer, your business will deteriorate. It'll take a while, but any time you think about that, go back to my story about Mr. Walton. Make sure that as you build your company, you're, you know what your customers are thinking, that you are really, really close to your customer. I'll sum it up. Listen to your customer very carefully. Get a miracle here if you need it. Then listen, listen, listen to your frontline people who work with the customer and you will know what to do. You won't have to guess and you won't have to hire consultants. You will know what to do. Should the company have clearly stated philosophies about the selection and treatment of the people in the company? Absolutely. And my advice is very simple here. All you have to do in figuring out how to treat your people is say, how do you want to be treated? That's fascinating. You just wonder if some of these big companies ever thought of that. Just treat people the way you'd like to be treated. Is it wiser for you to have me work for you or with you? The answer is obvious. Is it wiser for you to treat me like dirt or to treat me as an equal and with dignity and respect? The answer is obvious. Now, there's something in all of us. I'm third shift, high school dropout, working on the loading dock, minimum wage, and you're CEO. But right in here, there's something inside me that says, I am unique. I am special. There's only one person in the world like me. I am a human being. I've got a name. I don't want to be an East Three. Just call me Ross. You follow me? Now, if you will treat me with dignity and respect and treat me as a human being, and here's one unsolicited piece of advice to all you fellows running companies, make sure that the folks that I just described, your entry-level people, have the same benefits you have. They need them. And that sends a message to the troops. And it's a, a parable as the old military message. If you first feed the troops in combat, then you feed the officers. Entry-level people need that health care. If you didn't have it, you could pay for it out of your pocket. It's very basic stuff, but you can build an esprit and a team spirit that just makes it unfair for you to climb in the ring with your competitors if you treat your people as equals. And you all team up together and take on the world and beat them 10 times out of 10. That's what the game's all about. How do you handle the problems of fair treatment of women in the workplace? Well, it's really, of course, women are so talented in my business that uh, the men are at a disadvantage. But I came up with a very simple rule in the early days. I want ev to have an environment for the women in this company where every man in this company would be delighted to have his daughter work here. Now, that cleans out everything in one phrase. I mean, that goes to how you treat them. That goes to fair treatment in terms of recognition, promotion, so on and so forth, because dads are very, you know, protective of their daughters. So I want this to be a place where you'd be delighted to have your daughter work in every single aspect, and the rest took care of itself. What about employee benefits? Tiered benefits send a message. If I am entry level and I have rotten business, uh, uh, excuse me, and I have rotten benefits, and you're a senior executive and you have great benefits, well, I am obviously very different from you. Now, I can understand that my salary would be different, but to realize that my child could get the same medical attention that yours could get from the benefits the company provides sends a message. A lot of these big companies have multi-tiered retirement funds. No way. You check them, you'll find the executive fund is fully funded. You work your way on down, some of those are not fully funded. There should be one fund, and then I'll guarantee you they're fully funded. What about incurring debt? to build that new company? Well, my advice for the people starting new companies is try to avoid debt at all costs. If you have to, if it's capital intensive, you do it. I'd recommend that you sell shares in the company first. We're going to create enormous incentives for people to invest in small companies so that it's easy to get cash in that doesn't have to be paid back. You don't have that interest clock eating you alive. 
See, every small businessman understands my concern of the national debt, because his tiny little debt, that interest clock is chewing him every day. When he looks at $4 trillion, he passes out. But avoid it. It's like the measles. You know, avoid it if you can. If you have to have a little debt, fine. But remember, everything you borrow, you've got to pay back. Brains and wits, brains and wits. Keep the, keep the money down, the borrowed money down. How do you gear up that new company so it will compete with the established companies? It's the easiest thing in the world. Uh, it, they will send in huge armies, of, and these armies are bureaucratic. Send in tiny, high-talent teams. You'll beat them 10 times out of 10. They will dismiss you as a loony for showing up, and they will go into cardiac arrest when you win. How important is the founder once that uh, new company begins to grow? Well, that's the interesting part. Uh, in my case, at least, I just sort of sit there and enjoy the action because you have all these talented people. There's something I haven't said. You bring on all these talented people. You treat them with dignity. Everything's going well. But keep in mind, and this is so important for every company builder, all of those people have dreams, too. As the company grows, your dreams are being fulfilled. Are these people stockholders? Do they have a fair piece of the ownership? Are you recognizing and rewarding their extraordinary contribution by making them part owners of the company? Now, let's assume you're doing that. If you do everything right on compensation, including salaries, bonus, stock option, but you don't give people what I call their psychic rewards, you're denying them a huge part of it. For example, when they do something great, recognize it that day, not six months later, that day. Recognize it while they're still sweating from the effort. Now, the final point here, though, is you need to get out of the way and let them move up and run the company. The ultimate reward for one of your hot tigers is to give him your job. Well, you can be chairman of the board. You can just be on the board. If you're the founder and a big stockholder, you don't need a title. Keep titles in the background. Keep performance in the foreground. Don't have people making their career trying to be a vice president. Have them make their career trying to win every single competition. They'll probably wind up being president or king or whatever you want to make them. If you could give company presidents just one piece of advice based on your own experience, what would that be? It would be primarily to, again, I have a broken record here. Uh, I couldn't narrow it down to one. Well, if I had to do one, I'd say stay close to your customer. If I could have two, I'd say stay close to your frontline troops and the customers. And say three, once you bring all those talented people in, keep a magic environment where they want to stay and others want to come in. Then you can grow. How do you tap the full potential of each person on your team? Well, each person is different. You need to understand, this, these are not like nuts and bolts. These are human beings, and each one is different. You, you play to their strengths in order to tap their full potential. And you keep an environment where they are free to exercise their initiative and creativity. Well, the worst thing you can do to talented people is to freeze them in a procedure-oriented environment where they t are not able to think creatively and come up with unorthodox ideas that, believe it or not, are probably 10 times better than mine. And very important, very, very important, leave a lot of room for the 22, 23-year-olds that are too young, too inexperienced to ever have a great idea to come into your office, kick the door open, and say, why don't we paint it purple? And you'll say, well, you always painted it pink. Well, he says, no, but pink is wrong. This is a poor example, but the point is, a radical, unorthodox new idea, most of my net worth today rests squarely on the really weird ideas of people too young and too inexperienced to have a great idea, and all we did is listen. And nine times out of 10, we'd take that young tiger and say, okay, tough guy, if you're so in love with it, here's a small team, here's everything you need, just go do it. And he would walk out grinning, and three months later, he or she would have done something that most big companies would take five years to do and spend hundreds of millions of dollars on research, and they would come back with it. Now, that's the way you get things done. Also, as you build a, a new company, what is the importance of the families? I think the most important thing I can say to people building businesses in this country today, it ha started with nothing wound up on the other side of the economic spectrum. And I can tell you that money is the most overrated thing in the world. If you make money your god in building your company, you probably won't get there. If you make being the best your goal, you probably will get there 
and financial success will come as a byproduct. But on all those special days when your children need you at the Little League ball field, or at the campfire girl meetings, or the Girl Scout meetings, or at the PTA meetings, and all those once in a lifetime little opportunities when your children need you, if you're on the road and you're not there and you neglect them, you're going to pay a terrible price when they're grown. So keep your priorities straight. Keep an environment where your people can keep their priorities straight and give a lot of attention to your family. Now, I've had the interesting experience of knowing the wealthiest people in the world. And I can tell you that if you have all the marbles and your family is a mess and your children are a mess, you can be miserable and unhappy even though you're surrounded by things. So keep your priorities straight. And from my own perspective, I can tell you that I never felt wealthy until my children were grown, until they were good citizens, with a deep concern for other people and a willingness to do something about it. Keep that kind of environment. There's a very special time in your life when your children are growing up. Don't neglect your family to build your company. If you do, you may wind up wealthy but miserable. It's a poor reward at the end of your life. Here is one that you got to listen to. Success makes you vulnerable. Adversity builds strength. But success breeds arrogance and complacency. How do you avoid that? Every heavyweight boxer pays the price, gets there, becomes a champion of the world, then starts his arrogant phase, and some young person nobody ever heard of knocks him off in the next fight. Relish competition. The more brutal, the better. The bigger, the better. The greater the odds against you, the better. That keeps your organization lean and hard. Always look for the tough ones and go out to win every single point. Summarizing how important building new businesses, how important is that to the future of this country? It's everything. For example, if we had stayed where we were 50 years ago, uh, we'd still probably be building buggies and making buggy whips and bridles and saddles. You have to keep moving forward. Our great country, and God bless the people in Washington, they're not villains. See, I don't understand brain surgery, and they don't understand business. And business is our problem, and they talk to economists. You know, one of the candidates the other night on debate was, was bragging about how many economists he had on his staff, and I just sat there cringing. That's like having faith healers and rainmakers. These guys got us in this mess we're in. Now, economists base everything on theory. See, what we need is people with practical experience about business that know how to do this. We practice 19th century capitalism because that was what used to work. Japan and Germany didn't get capitalism until 1945, so they created 1950 capitalism. We've got 1850 capitalism. They're moving towards 21st century capitalism, and we have one of the two political parties saying, let's just keep things the way they are. Well, if, and the other one's saying, let's have a little change, but they don't know what they're talking about. And the people that asked me to go on the ballot are saying, let's just fix it and get ready for the 21st century, pass the American dream on to our children. That's what we're talking about. And maybe the best summary I could give you of the perseverance I'm talking about is one of Churchill's famous speeches. It's his shortest speech. And this is the entire speech. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross, and thank you for watching tonight. Be on the lookout for additional programs that will make you a better informed voter. And on November 3rd, cast your ballot. Good night. If you would like to learn more about Ross Perot's solutions on how to get America back on track, please read United We Stand, How We Can Take Back Our Country. It outlines the problems America faces and gives concrete solutions on how we can clean up the mess in Washington deal with the deficit, and create new jobs. Remember, Election Day is November 3rd. Don't waste your vote on politics as usual. Don't let special interests run our country any longer. Get out and vote. And vote for a real change.